Geeks, Nerds, Gamers, and Trolls. This is your MMOBomb.com first look at Shroud of the Avatar. This game was kickstarted back in 2013, hit early access in 2014, launched officially as of March of this year, 2018, and for a couple of weeks now, it is now officially free to play on Steam. It has uh, taken me some time to kind of get a basic grasp of what's going on in this game. So, as always, this is a not a full review or an expert guide. This is a first look. We're going to take a look at what the game looks like, sounds like, plays like. Help you decide if it's a game that you might want to download and try for free. Now, it's not every day I get to do a full-fledged MMO like this. So, I've taken plenty of time to at least get the basics of what's going on here. Here again, I'm not max level or anything like that. I'm... 20 somewhere between like 25 30 hours into the game uh when i stopped playing some of this footage is from before that as i was leveling up and just kind of getting footage of my experience as i went along uh, but i do have a little bit of experience in the game now several hours and so we're going to talk a little bit about my experiences in the game so far for shroud of the avatar now this game has a name attached to the development of it that you might might recognize and that's uh, Richard Garriott. Uh, you might know him from a little game called Ultima. So if you're an old school Ultima player, Ultima Online, any of the other Ultima games, this is going to harken back to some of that a little bit. Obviously it's third person 3D MMO, so a little different than some of the Ultima games. But it is old school, very old school in a lot of ways. Some of them good, some of them not so good, and we're going to talk about that. Now, there is more to this game than meets the eye, but the first thing we just have to talk about is what actually does immediately hit the eye, and that's the graphics and the animations. Old school. This game was kickstarted in 2013. These graphics obviously harken back to a time long before that. What you see is what you get graphically. This is this is it. Um, it doesn't get it much better than this. There actually are some pretty cool particle effects uh, with spells and some of the attack animations. But the game world itself, it's, it's not heavily detailed. There's not great textures. The character animations are, are a little clunky, a little choppy. Uh, nothing fantastic. It's supposed to harken back and give you that nostalgic feel feeling of the old school MMOs and it does a little bit at first for me and then it starts to grade me just a little bit so it is old school looking I believe that was a conscious decision I'm not sure that was the right decision we'll get into my personal opinions on that towards the end of the video uh, but just looking at it yeah um, the game engine isn't fantastic there's a lot of pop in the shadows really really grind the game engine to a halt uh creates lots of lag lots of pop in uh problems here and there that yes can be addressed over time but this game has been out for a while so you know it runs it runs okay but it doesn't run phenomenally and also along with that comes all of the loading screens i hope you got some space on your ssd because there are loading screens for days this game is broken up into a series of quote unquote adventure zones and then also cities and to get to those you have to exit the adventure zone you're in which creates a loading screen to go to a big overworld map and this large overworld map and we'll see this later on in the video you have to travel to the city or the next adventure zone you want to go to to enter that creates another loading screen and there again to exit creates another loading screen so lots and lots of loading screens they're not incredibly quick to load even on an ssd i'm playing on an ssd they're not the most god-awful thing in the history of loading screens, but they're not super fast either. So just know the, the engine and the loading, it does have a tendency to chug a little bit. Turning the shadows completely off seemed to help that a little bit, but the game just kind of looked even more low res with the shadows turned off. So I tried to keep them turned on at least minimally for the video that you, way you can get an idea of sort of what the game looks like. Along with the old school graphics comes an old school UI, and here again, I'm not sure that was maybe the best choice. Yes, it's supposed to harken back to the old school MMOs and give you that nostalgic feeling, but I'd really find myself wishing that the UI would have been a little more updated than what it is, a little more modern, but it is what it is. Visually, you have to take the game for what it is, because this is what it's going to be, quite frankly. It's going to look old school. 
It's going to look low res. It's not going to be super high def. It's not going to be bleeding edge graphics. So if you're a big graphics whore, and I'm not hating on you if you are, but I'm just saying if you're big on the way a game looks and you see this and you're instantly turned off, you might want to consider just walking away now because it doesn't get any better than this. However, if you can look past the graphics, the UI, and some of the not great optimization within the game engine itself, there are some fantastic features in this game that harken back to old school MMOs in a very, very good way. And I'm pretty sure I just said harken back like a dozen times at least. I'm going to try to quit doing that too. So as you may have noticed, while I'm questing, I'm having to explore and go find NPCs and talk to different NPCs and try to find the ones that have quests. No exclamation marks over the head. No quest hubs that are super obvious like... Hey, the, all these people have quests here on the mini-map, or the compass, actually. There's a compass here. Uh, once you do talk to several NPCs and find some that do have quests for you, the compass will mark certain things on your map, areas you need to go to. Like if an NPC gives you a quest to go to another camp and infiltrate that camp, it will get marked on your compass, so you at least kind of know the area you're going to. As you explore around, you're going to be able to open your mini-map and see some of the places you've explored and kind of be able to hover over them and see what they are. So if you need to go back to them, you can open that map easily and at least tell which direction you need to run. And there is a lot of running back and forth in the game. Uh, but I do like that the questing is all dialogue-based. You actually have to go talk to the NPCs to do things like get quests and turn in quests. You have to remember which one you went to. You do have a quest journal that gives you some little hints, especially in like who you talk to and who you need to go back and talk to again once you've completed a quest. But you do have to go back and find that person and know who you talk to and look around for them. And you're going to want to walk up to certain NPCs and ask them their name especially. And then they'll put their name above their heads so that you can easily just kind of look around and see where the person you're looking for is. Now the Dialogue box is really cool because it's actually based on text in the box. So as the NPCs are talking to you, there's going to be certain words here like you can see on the screen now that are underlined. You can click on those and get more feedback and sometimes that leads to quests and sometimes it's just sort of exposition of what's going on out in the world. Down at the bottom, there's other keywords that you could put in to sort of further along the dialogue. And then you can, if there's something that you think you want to ask them or they might know about, you can just type it in the box and hit enter as a keyword. And if, that, if that's a word that activates some of the dialogue they have, they'll go ahead and talk back to you. And if it's a word that they don't actually have any actual response for, they've got, most of them have like sort of a repetitive response. It's like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, pay attention to the dialogue. There is lots of reading in this game. You do have to read the dialogue to know what's going on. You do have to click on those keywords and use those keywords to move the dialogue along and to pick up your quests and know what's going on. Another old school feature I'm really a fan of is the classless system. As, as I'm using different abilities, they're just leveling up and gaining power and gaining levels as I'm using them. The more I use them, the more powerful they become. Within each tree, you can start going down that tree when like a basic ability out of like the blades tree where I'm dual wielding swords. After I've used that to a certain level, then I can start going down a skill tree and adding more abilities out of the blades tree. There's a ton of trees to choose from. There's magic of many different schools. There's different weapon types, different armor types, all sorts of different skills that you can use to level up and then spend gold at a crafter. You do have to go to a crafter. You can't just open the skill menu and put points in and go to that, go to that uh, trainer, excuse me, go to the trainer, spend gold, and you can turn a new skill once it's available when the previous skills are leveled up enough. So you can basically make whatever class you want. You can specialize in one thing, super hardcore. You can make all sorts of different hybrid classes if you would like. And there's also a skill bar switching mechanism where like if I've got blades equipped right now, I can hit a button and switch over to a bow or magic. And also along with that, you can set up those, those decks. That way you change equipment as well. Now there is like a cast time if you're changing equipment and stuff along with your skill bar but you can't automatically change to the proper equipment. There is fizzle for spells, so if you're wearing cloth, you're more likely to get a spell off if you're trying to cast it than you are if you're wearing a bunch of heavy armor, which increases your chance of that spell fizzling out and not actually activating. Uh, you've probably seen me running around a few times with these dual-wielded swords, and I set them ablaze, and that's a magic ability under the either the sun or the fire tree. It's probably the fire tree. 
And sometimes it does fizzle out because I'm wearing a bunch of heavy armor because I'm focusing on the dual wield melee, but I like setting the swords ablaze because it does some fire damage to them. A little little dot that does a little extra damage. Plus it just, I mean, to be perfectly honest, it just looks cool. Exploration is going to be a big part of finding quests. Uh, once you walk into like an encampment like this, and you've pretty much talked to everybody and done all the quests they had available for you. You're going to need to move on and explore and go find another area and go find more NPCs to talk to to pick up quests or start killing things to get possible quests. So you're going to have to explore around a little bit like ESO where if you don't have quests to do, you need to go to an area of the map you haven't been to yet to find the next section that you're going to need to pick up quests and kill things and run fetch quests and all that. It's pretty typical questing, but you got to go find them. You got to explore around. It's not going to hold your hand. And that's a big part of this game. It doesn't hold your hand at all. And that's part of why it's taken me so long to get this first look out because it doesn't hold your hand teaching you much of anything. You have to go figure it out yourself. Get ready to have a browser open on the side, especially when you get into crafting and things like that. Uh, even streamers that I've watched who have played this game for a long time when they're crafting and stuff, they've got a wiki page open on the side or something that have like crafting recipes and, and the reagents you're going to need to create things. So just be ready. This game is going to just kind of throw you out there and just say fly, bitch. One more little old school aspect that really caught my attention is nighttime is really dark and it's really hard to tell what's going on. That's because you have spells that help you see. Like you can see, I've got this little light flowing above my head. I just started out with this skill, uh, like a little candlelight ability. It lasts for like four minutes, and the more you use it, the more it levels up, and the more you put points in, into that concentration of magic type, uh, the longer it will last. And also, a little unexpected thing, giving sort of the, you know, the dated visuals and stuff of the game that surprised me a little bit. My flaming swords actually create like a good area of light for me able to see with. So if I'm in combat and I've got my swords lit up with fire, and I, I can actually see pretty good what's going on around me. About the same area as the little candlelight thing does. So like I said, when you, when you say old school MMO, there is some bad, but there is some good too. There's some things that some other games could really take a lesson from. We don't need everything streamlined. Yes, it can be a little hardcore trying to figure things out, but sometimes some of this old school throwback stuff, the classless system, some of the skill ups, that's actually really cool. So let's jump real quick and take a look at these skill trees. Now here again, you're going to have to go find you a trainer somewhere. I just happened to find one in the one of the first little camps I was in. So here's a look at the skill trees. Up top, you can see sort of your combat abilities. And this is your basic stuff like the blades and bludgeon and heavy armor and light armor specializations. And as you level those up, you're going to have access to other skills that you can spend gold to unlock. And that's going to give you new abilities that you can move on the bar. Now, you've got the two bars to play with. So you do have limited space on what can be on the action bar. So you are going to have to pick and choose. But it looks like you can eventually unlock everything. And like I said, if you look at the magic there in the middle, there are plenty of schools of magic to choose from, including healing, all sorts of different magic effects. And then there's some specialty abilities down at the bottom, like pet taming and focus and things like that, that sort of can provide some utility skills. Um, but you got to use them and level them up to be able to get down to that next level. All in all, the character customization systems are really awesome. I like the throwback systems as far as that's concerned. Questing has been pretty typical fare. Finding the quests, you have to go out and really explore and talk to lots of folks and read the dialogue and, and make sure you're not missing keywords that, that could possibly get you quests. It's going to make you money and get you XP. Uh, there are levels in the game. It's not just like throw it up on the screen, uh, but if you open your character window, you can hover over and see what level you are. Uh, but it's not like, especially if you're questing in a zone, it's not the most important thing in the world. I was catching levels without necessarily realizing I was catching levels. It's as much important, obviously, that these skills are being leveled up. And those include your crafting skills. Crafting is going to be pretty important. Uh, we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. But there again, this is a really in-depth MMO. Uh, it, it's maybe not the prettiest thing in the world, but there's a lot of depth here. So we're not going to be able to talk in-depth about everything. But I do want to jump right now to the section where you go to the overworld map and travel to a city. Take you into the city. And let's talk a little bit about crafting and a little bit about player housing. Now, they did recently revamp the tutorial for new players when you're first starting out, which does te teach you some of the very basics of the game. 
but it doesn't teach you a whole lot about how to get around in the world. And I did have to go Google how to get the heck out of that first adventure zone I was in, get to the overworld map. And then I had to look up where the town was I was trying to go to. But one of the quests I have is to deliver a dagger that we found earlier to a certain town. And so now I'm on this overworld map. and I was like, oh, I'll be able to see the towns, except I can't. So I had to go Google up a soda map and figure out where I needed to go from where I was. Luckily, the uh, next town I needed to go to wasn't very far, but this is the overworld map. This is how you're gonna travel. You get out of each adventure zone. As you can see, the little flags that uh, show you where little zones are, and when you walk up to them, that's gonna give you a little uh, button you can hit to enter that zone. Or as you walk up to different towns and cities, you'll be able to walk into those. There are NPC towns, and there are player-owned towns, and that's gonna come into play a lot when you're looking for player housing. There are different deeds, some specifically for player towns, some that can go anywhere, including NPC towns. So as you're shopping for deeds for property and then for your house itself, you're going to keep in mind that uh, you need to buy the right one to live in the town that you want to live in. And I end up bypassing it on this map, but as I came into the city that I was looking for, it was actually at a little section outside that was under siege. So I had an option, at least, that I could have went in and battled my way into the city through the siege, or luckily I could just bypass it and go straight into the city because as I was recording this, I was recording for the video and I got to this city and I was like, it's under siege. I'm going to spend like 30 minutes to an hour probably before I can f uh, keep on recording for the video. Luckily, it let me just bypass it and go straight into the city. So we're going to load into the city here. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about crafting though. I don't have any footage of crafting uh, because I don't have enough materials to actually make anything, but I did spend some time looking into it. Now, just like with your combat skills, you've got a skill tree that looks pretty identical that works for your crafting skills as well. And you're going to go see a crafting trainer to level those up and get additional skills. And just like with your combat skills, you're going to gain levels just by doing the things. I have gathered a few things and my gathering skills have gone up a little bit. And then when you go in, you have to find the right working stations, as you're probably used to, to smelt like your raw ore into ingots and then you got to go find a blacksmithing station to turn those ingots into the metal parts of weapons or armor that you're trying to make now i have seen where you're not just going to walk up to a blacksmithing station and hammer it a few times and make like a new mace you're going to walk up to the blacksmithing station and make like a head for the mace and then you're going to have to go and have the crafting levels and the materials to make the handle for the mace. And then you're going to have to assemble those. So crafting is as in-depth as some of the other level up and combat skills are. Just also keep in mind that it is going to be a little tedious if you're going to make things. But making things is going to be pretty important. Items do have durability. A lot of the items that I've, everything I'm wearing right now, as a matter of fact, I just picked up out in the world. And they already had a ton of durability loss on them. You can pick up kits to repair them, but your handcrafted stuff is going to be better materials. You can control more of what you're getting and what you're using. So crafting is actually useful, at least in the leveling portion of the game. So you're going to want to level some of those skills up or just make lots of money and just buy stuff off of other players. Uh, one of the fun things about the player housing is they all can stick vendors outside of their house. So you can walk by and they can put items up for sale. And that's going to vary depending on which vendor you're talking to, which city you're in. So you got to roam around if you're looking for something and go to the different vendors and check it out. There's also a marketplace on the website. We'll take a look at here in a little bit where people are offering up things for sale. We'll get into that a little bit because there's a, a little, it's a little funny there, but we'll talk about that in a minute. As you can see, this is a blacksmith, so I could come to him and buy some of the reagents that I need to do some of the crafting, and then I've got to have the materials that I've scavenged out in the world and collected, and then you can walk over to like the forge that he's got over there and smelt some of the ore down into iron ingots and things like that. And I'm pretty okay with all of that. I wish more games would make crafting at least one of the most important ways to gear yourself out. And the fact that you can do all the crafting uh, if you've got the time put into it uh, is phenomenal. I love games that let me just gather and craft and gear myself up and do whatever I wanna do and make what I wanna make. And the fact that you stack that on top with you can play whatever class you wanna play or whatever hybrid you wanna play and you can gear yourself out however you want to. Uh, I mean, it's really open-ended gameplay as far as what your character is going to be in the world. And that's an old-school thing that more games should bring back. 
All right, just running around the city a little bit, letting you see some of it. We're running past a couple of uh, player housing areas here, and we're going to cut to a clip where we actually show off uh, some of the lots and talk a little bit about how you can get player housing, how you can't get player housing, and what it's going to cost you. So let's start out with one of the neatest little things i found. Uh, this is a piece of player housing that somebody owns. They've got a vendor outside that offered a little document that's like, hey, are you looking for a, a place to live? And basically this person is offering, if you come in, you can decorate it however you want to, just log in, do the upkeep of the house. You can live here for free, rent free. You don't have to pay the taxes on the property, anything like that. So there are plenty of opportunities out there for people who just either want to rent you their property out or if you just maintain it and decorate it however you want to they still own the property and keep in mind whatever you put in there if they're the owners of the property they can take out anything they want that you put in there so it's sort of a trust thing but there are people who offer like hey just you know log in every day and take care of the house and i'll, I'll make you a co-owner or whatever of the property and that'll keep their upkeep because if you buy housing out of the cash shop you don't have to pay taxes on it every day so there are different amounts depending on what size lot you get, obviously. And from what I've read, it starts at like 500 gold pieces a day and goes up from there, depending on the size of the lot that you've got available. And then you've got to purchase the house that goes with it as well. But how you get the actual property deeds is a whole nother animal. So obviously the easy answer is go to the cash shop. And they like to call their cash shop the add-on shop. And we'll take a look at that here in a minute because it is in a separate browser. You have to actually go to the website to go to their uh, quote-unquote add-on shop. So it's not actually in-game. So I've got some recording footage of that. And we're going to walk around and look at a house that is actually decorated here for a minute while I talk a little more. But yeah, you actually have to go out. And some of that stuff is quite expensive. Uh, so keep in mind, you know, the game is free now. You can own property, but you're going to have to acquire it. And the cash shop's one of the ways to do that. Some of the property deeds and some of the houses are quite expensive. There is another way. You can buy for like a ton of gold, like 10,000 gold or 5,000 gold or 50,000 gold. Or you just have to excuse me. I don't remember the exact amount. You can buy raffle tickets and they do like weekly raffles uh, for, for some of the, the lower property deeds. But you're essentially buying exactly that, a raffle ticket. It's not guaranteed you're going to get it. So other than renting or buying that raffle ticket, you're going to need to visit the old cash shop, help support the game if you're going to own property and houses and decorations and stuff like that. There is a ton of stuff available in the game that you can craft and create and buy from other players. So it's not like everything is in the cash shop. As a matter of fact, in their cash shop, they say up the top that there's, you know, almost everything has some sort of equivalent that can be acquired just in game. So it's not all cash shop. There are alternatives available. Uh, but obviously the fastest, easiest way is going to be through the cash shop if you've got the money to do so. As you can see, this person's even got like little harvesting nodes that they're growing. So these are, these are items that I have harvested out in the world before that they're growing right here in their backyard. And a real quick disclaimer, if I'm not going super into depth into everything, I apologize. Like I said, there's a ton of stuff to go over in this game. It's super deep. So yes, we are sort of scratching the surface on some of this stuff. And if I do get some details wrong here and there, hardcore Shroud of the Avatar players, I apologize. I am trying to keep as much of this straight as I possibly can. So there is sort of a monthly sub for $9. We'll go back and take a look at that here in a second. But I just want to kind of flip through the cash shop here. Uh, as I said, as you can tell, uh, it's a browser. I had to open uh, Chrome here to get to this, so we had to record this separately. Um, lots of different decoration items, customization available in the game. When we get over to the properties and the deeds, and you see decorations for your houses, there's emotes, there's different color packages for costumes and decorations in the house, all sorts of different things that you would expect to find in the cash shop, especially for a game that's promoting player housing like that. As you can see, the prices on the houses and the property deeds oh boy um you're gonna want to really want that if you're gonna go into the cash shop to purchase some of that stuff uh some of it's pretty pricey and like uh some of these prices are on sale right now so this is sort of explaining that the deeds some of the deeds are for player towns only some of the deeds are for npc towns or pretty much anywhere you want to put them 
Uh, the prices do change depending on that. If you go just a player town, you can get it a little cheaper. Uh, if you want to be able to plop down an NPC town like the town, like the city we were just showing off, uh, it's going to cost you a little more. Now there is a unique little thing, and let's let's talk about this first since the, since this popped up. Uh, these are the the gold crowns. Uh, there are special vendors in the game, and there again, you do actually have to go find the vendor uh, that offer just unique things. And here's sort of a list of what the one in the city we were just in offers for those for those gold crowns. And there are different ones that have a chance to drop in the game, and the gold ones can be changed into like the iron ones or the white ones or all the different types. So on the forums, there is a marketplace. This marketplace allows players to advertise things they want to sell. These things can be sold for real world currency. And most of the stuff in there, I didn't see very much that was being offered for in-game gold. Most of it was being offered for real world currency, including crafted items, including property deeds and houses and different things that players have acquired playing the game. And a lot of it is like, you know, we'll sell through PayPal. The game says... Up top, at the very top of this forum, they allow it. They're not going to officially, you know, sponsor it. So it's buyer beware, but they do allow the selling of things for real world currency from players to players directly through means such as PayPal. Interesting way to maybe make some cash on the side, maybe buy some things. Most of the prices on the marketplace are cheaper than in the in-game store. So keep that in mind. If you do have some cash you want to plop down, check out the player marketplace first. All right, this video is getting super long, so let's jump out and take a look at character creation real quick. There is an offline mode in the game. Uh, if you're playing offline mode, there is no cash shop. Everything is available in the game for in-game currency. However, best I can tell, none of that can be transferred over to the live online version of the game. But you can play offline if you want to and just sort of check things out and test things and try things over there or just play by yourself forever if you want to. This is sort of the beginning of the new tutorial. We're not going to run through the whole thing uh, because when you first create your character, you give, you give them a name. And then you basically go to this mirror and you do character creation. But this just sort of gives you an idea of this is the little islands floating above the world. And I was here for, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes. I was not in any big hurry at all. Uh, but character creation happens after you start the game. So talking to this lady a little bit, then we're going to go down the aisle way here and actually do the character creation by interacting with a mirror. And like I said, this tutorial does not teach you everything about the game. There were still tons of stuff I had to go figure out for myself. No hand-holding at all. Uh, this didn't actually exist, this, this tutorial, until not that long ago. It's a fairly recent update. And speaking of updates, this game is still very much in development. It's out of early access. But uh, they just recently, right after free-to-play launch, added fishing to the game. So they are still cranking out updates. They are still adding features to the game. So this is character creation. Uh, it's fairly basic. Uh, there's quite a bit of sliders. Uh, size only affects height. It doesn't affect, like you can't make a big fat guy like I tried to. Um, some basic hairstyles, some basic hair colors, uh, and then a bunch of sliders for each section of the face. Uh, you don't get any body sliders. All the armor is pretty much made to fit on a scaling version of the basic body. So all the sliders are on your face for hair. There's some facial hair options, things like that. And what I'm gonna do here is just flip through some of these just pretty quick, just so you can get an overall feel of what's available in the character creation. Like I said, it's it's at least different sliders. You can make a fairly unique looking character if you want to. And just to be fair, uh, we'll, we'll run through the sliders and stuff here real quick on the different facial parts. And then we'll jump over and take a look at the ladies as well. Uh, for for just a second so you can kind of see the the hairstyles and hair colors on those but yeah lots of sliders so i mean there's at least that it's not you're not going to make like the most unique interesting crazy looking character in the world but you can spend some time here and not at least look like every other guy that's walking down the road you're not you, you're probably going to still look somewhat related but you're not going to look like their identical twin uh, which is good you know, at the end of the day, you're going to be covered in a helmet and stuff most of the time anyway. So, you know, get, but, but, you know, when you're creating a character, that doesn't matter. You got to get that face and that look right. And you want to feel unique and create an attachment to that character in character creation. It doesn't matter if you never see their face again, if they're always covered in a helmet, if you're always staring at the back of their head, it doesn't matter. I know, at least for me, 
uh, I got to get that look right the first time. And interestingly enough, they seem to share several hairstyles between the males and females. Uh, I think the guy that I made in the first clip actually had these pigtails uh, exactly like this, like long pigtails. So we have already spent over 30 minutes just scratching the surface of what this game has to offer. Old school, uh, a lot of good ways, a lot of bad ways. Visually, I'm not impressed. A lot of these old school systems in place though, man, I really do miss some of that stuff. I only wish, and here we go, personal opinion, 100% subjective personal opinion incoming trigger warning. This is just what I think. I wish games when they say we want to make an old school MMO would implement some of the systems, the important crafting, the classless systems, the leveling up as you use skills, even maybe the text-based questing. I'm okay with that too. Why does, why do we have to include dated graphics for an old school MMO feel? Why can't we have all the great old school systems with the new shiny graphics? Why can't it look pretty as well as play old school like we want? I know for me personally, when I think of the old school games that I want to play, I think of the, the systems and the world and the way I interacted with it and the way I could customize my character and create my own person more than how the game looked. It didn't have to look old to give me a nostalgia trip. Let's just let's make one where all these great systems are in place. You're skilling up. What you do is important. You can make your character what you want, crafting your own gear and really going out in the world and making a place for yourself. Why does it have to look like it wasn't made in 2009? We can have both. Why can't we have both? All right, that's that's all I've got. Uh, 30 something minutes is all I've got. And like I said, we've barely scratched the surface of what's going on in this game. I have not talked about a whole lot of things super in depth. There's tons and tons to learn about this game as you go. Prepare to Google the crap out of stuff, though, because the game does not hold your hand. Shroud of the Avatar, now available for free on Steam. I want to play some more. I wish it didn't look like it does, but I really want to play some more based on the gameplay experiences in the game. As always, be sure to head over to MMOBomb.com for all the latest news and information on all the free-to-play games. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't already for more first looks and podcasts and news and all sorts of neato things. You can check me out over on twitter.com slash noobfridge where I tweet whatever it is I've got going on. Appreciate you guys checking out this first look for Shroud of the Avatar now available for free on Steam for now. This first look, as basic as it is, is done if you want to see more, just download the game and check it out. There's plenty to dive into, to sink your teeth into. God, we haven't even started. I'm 30 hours into the game and haven't even begun to get into what this game has to offer. This is done. I am out. Maybe in 30 more hours, I'll be able to actually craft myself something. <laughs>